if I'm an HR person and I want to really assert control of our company, it's like, look, I've got the law on my side. I've got your career in my hands and I can nuke you on social and moral grounds whenever I want. Like that's an incredibly powerful set of capabilities. In these larger institutions, is, is, are, are, are those apparatuses now so powerful that they actually run the show and they can't be taken out? Or at some point, is there some sort of revolt either from the top or from the bottom where people are just like, I'm no longer willing to live like this. Okay, folks, uh, welcome back. Uh, we're thrilled to have you all here again. Um, we have a big show today. Uh, once again, uh, we have gone to the uh, t- uh, the Twitter the Twitter sphere, now known as the X sphere, the Z sphere, um, to uh, to get your questions and many good questions poured in. The topic uh, for today is building startups in the post COVID world. Um, and Ben, we're going to cover four uh, sets of questions. So one is just on the post COVID environment generally. Yeah. Um, second is on kind of the modern state of building startups, what's changed, what's not. Uh, third is on hybrid and remote work, which continues to be a hot topic. And then fourth is uh, building startups in the era of AI, um, which All is, right. of course, the other big change. Um, so uh, we will dive right in. Um, very first question, big, uh, sort of big, big picture question. Um, uh, Sai asks, uh, what do you think was the biggest tech disruption that came out of COVID? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think the the one that I'm hoping is the biggest disruption is actually warp speed because, you know, we've been uh, kind of through many iterations of trying to figure out how the government should be involved in tech. Um, and we've seen this all over the world with many different governments. And, uh, you know, there was the famous kind of government being a venture capitalist for clean tech. Uh, which led to the, you know, giant cylinder investment that didn't turn out so well. Um, and then, you know, kind of like various other activities that haven't been so good. But the the model um, that seems to work the best in the U.S. anyway is the model we used in the space program, um, which kind of created the chip industry, which was, okay, if you can build this chip, <laughs> then we will uh, become a giant customer. And that's sort of what they did with Warp Speed. They said, look, if you can make this vaccine, we will buy a lot of it. Um, and that kind of uh, is a huge thing because it really changed the nature of vaccine development in the sense that prior to that, it's just very, very challenging economically to fund vaccine development because, um, you know, Basically, the the trials are very difficult because you're uh, try, doing trials on people who are not sick. Um, and so that really, really complicates the issue. And it's why we don't, you know, we went so long with the Ebola vaccine. And, you know, it's very hard to come up with vaccines for various things because it's just too hard to finance. But if the government says, hey, if you make one that works... <laughs> and that we like, um, then we'll give you a bag of money, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, everything changes. And I think that um, for things that are strategic to the United States, that's the right model. So, you know, hopefully that is kind of a government uh, interaction, which will create many technological breakthroughs, which, you know, hopefully came out of COVID. No, you know, I can't resist, you know, kind of noting that, um, you know, the enormous amount of enthusiasm uh, for the vaccine and for warp speed, both you know during the during the last year of the Trump administration when it yeah. was a uh, Republican project, and then sort of an equal amount of enthusiasm in 2021 when it was a Democratic project. Um, yeah, uh, both parties, at least sitting here today, seem to have just let it, the whole idea die. And and I mean, that's in two parts. Number one, just it, all of a sudden, nobody cares about like vaccines. Like there there are no calls for like expanded vaccine development programs. And then of course there are no calls for expanding uh, Operation Warp Drive to other domains. Are you? Yeah. Does that depress you or do you think that idea is still there and we just need to like, we, we can like kind of light it back up? Well, I, I think we can light it back up because it was so recent and it, and it actually worked very well. I mean, you know, like there are issues with the vaccine and so forth, but at least the initial vaccine against the initial variant was a home run, um, you know, and then like we got more variants and the vaccine didn't work and there were side effects and there, there were other things. But, you know, as vaccine development goes, it was a miracle. So sadly, Ben just got us banned on YouTube. So we will see you all on Rumble. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's oh, it. We got Rumble. 
that's a that's a joke hopefully that's a joke um yeah so let me let me just add add my voice which is yeah i mean you know very clearly like what what we could what we could really use as an operation warp speed for a whole broad cross section of technological developments there's a version of this for uh for the for the for chips but uh it's it's sort of uh seems a little bit stalled in the launchpad although maybe it's it's in the process of of gathering gathering uh momentum (laughs) yeah perhaps (laughs) maybe Maybe. Anyway, I, I think that was a great. Okay, that's a great one. Um, I'm going to add. Um, I'm going to add the, just the obvious one, but it's worth calling out because we've all gotten used to it so fast. But um, uh, you know, uh, video conferencing. Um, you know, it's it's worth noting that uh, the concept. It's just a, it's a great case study of sort of technological adoption. Uh, the first video conferencing system, uh, I, I believe, was the AT and T Picture Phone in 1965, uh, which was a complete failure. Um, and then there was you know 40. 50 years, 65, 50 years. Well, and, and, and the rationale for the failure, I think, wasn't actually true, right? Like, so for years, the mm-hmm. rationale was people don't want to see each other when they talk on the phone, right? Like it was a user behavior yeah. that was supposed to have been with thing or something else. Yeah, there was that, you know, which, which is, of course, reminiscent of at one point the movie studios thought that people didn't want to, didn't want to hear actors talk. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. And so, you know, there... You know, there, yeah, that could be, um, you know, that could be, but also I think there was also just bad. I, I think there was just a, a straight up chicken and egg problem, uh, or what our, our colleague Andrew Chen calls the cold start problem, which is, you know, video conferencing unit number one is totally useless because there's nobody to call. Um, and so if everybody has video conferencing set up, it becomes very useful, but there, there was no, it, it is striking that between 1965 to 2020, there was no real slingshot effect. I mean, you remember, you know, Ben, we were obviously involved in Skype, you know, f- almost 15 years ago now, and they had video calling and, you know, some people used it, but, it, you know, it was hardly even the main feature of Skype at that point. Um, but anyway, so obviously, so obvious observation is COVID has, you know, lit, lit that on fire um, starting in 2020. It was sort of remarkable to see everybody discover webcams and Zoom and video conferencing and, and all these things also, of course, cause podcasts and YouTube and so forth, like this format to take off. Um, but, uh, it, it is striking, like how, how long it took, uh, for that to happen and then how immediate the cutover and then, and then that's stuck. And what we'll talk later about, you know, how much, you know, hybrid and remote work continue, but I think everybody just now takes it for granted that they're available by video when they're, when they're not available in person. And that, that seems to now be a, a human universal that definitely was not the case in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. It actually kind of showed how like horrible most, uh, conference call systems were like when you're in a big room with like lots of little microphones and nobody can hear anything. Yeah. It was such a, uh, it was such a big step to just, uh, to, to, to not have that, to have the, have everybody on a, uh, as they were much better, of course, to have everybody just on a video call yeah. versus a hybrid meeting. And then the, the, the other tech disruption I would just highlight is sort of a broader societal disruption that, that leads to uh, a lot of tech opportunity, which is something I've talked about in the past, which is just, I think COVID was another just massive blow to, to you know, for, for, I don't know, say for better or for worse, deserved or not. COVID was a massive blow to societal trust in institutions uh, and trust in authority. And so a very large number of people um, in the U.S. and uh, certainly in the Western world, you know, kind of saw what happened during COVID and they saw the operation of various kinds of authorities. Um, and they, you know, they, 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 I think they view what happened as a fundamental breach of trust. Uh, and, and by the way, I would say like that's actually true of both people who think that, for example, lockdowns should have been lifted much sooner and also for people who think they should have gone on much longer. Nobody was happy. Nobody was happy, or even the vaccine. People who thought there should be universal vaccination, the government didn't push hard enough, or people who thought that vaccines should not have been mandated. Um, and and the, co- the common theme here, of course, is just kind of this world we live in now, um, where just that you know co- generalized trust in institutional authority is collapsing. I've, I've mentioned in the past; you can see this in all the surveys. Gallup does a regular survey of, of trust in all the major institutions, and it's, it's basically been falling in a secular you know line across most major institutions since the 1970s. You know, we, by the way, we way predating the internet, um, uh, but uh, but accelerating in recent years, and then you know specifically since 2020. Uh, for a bunch of big institutions, the, the the credibility has just fallen off a cliff. Um, and so again, for, for for better or for worse, you know, the average person in Western societies now has just an incredibly dim view of the ruling authorities. And that that is something that, you know, is going to ripple through our society in many ways and, and already is. But but also, I think, uh, you know, generally speaking, it's bullish on new institutions um, because as people get kind of mad, madder and madder at the existing status quo institutions, they're going to want more alternatives. Yeah, you know, I've been observing like a really wild phenomenon along those lines where if you listen to any economist or read any newspaper you'll think the economy is doing fantastic and then if you read any survey of the american people you'll see the economy is a disaster and that i don't think could have happened in any other era uh, where people were so confident that what they were reading and hearing was false 
that they would actually stick to their own view, like almost universally on it. Um, and, you know, of course, the delta is like how you interpret inflation. Um, and it turns out if you need to like buy stuff in our rate, like for you and I, like inflation is, is not that big a deal. But for like, I think, you know, most of the populace, it's yeah. a huge deal. Um, but, you know, kind of ignored in the reporting of, of economic statistics to, to, to a very, very large degree. Yeah, well, as you know, just because inflation goes down doesn't mean prices go down. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so if you're paying 30% more for groceries and inflation falls, you're still paying 30% more for groceries. Well, and then Larry Summers had a really interesting piece where he pointed out, like, it, we're not counting, like, the interest rate impact on inflation. Um, which is massive if you consider like, you know, rent or like mortgage payments or these kinds of things, you know, it's, it, it dwarfs everything. Um, and, you know, we're not counting it. So that's a problem. I have a much longer speech I could give about how the public health, basically public health officials really, um, you know, uh, basically uh, blew the blew a giant hole in the, in the side of the credibility of their entire, <laughs> yeah, of their entire, uh, they, they made the entire things up there. Field. It turns out, yes, they weren't totally honest at every step, uh, and, and, and and I bring that up because I could argue that uh, you know basically that that mentality, the mentality from authorities of we're going to lie to you for your own good, yeah. um, which has you know been a very common you know kind of thing for authorities for you know forever, um, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, the whole the history of the United States, right? Yeah, well, even before I even say, you know, even before that, even the long lived history of all institutions, all, all, all authority, which is ba basic, basically the, the theory would be basically that, you know, reality is messy. Um, but as a leader, you can't get up there and say reality is messy. You have to get up there and have a, you know, simple, clean message that people can understand and follow. And so there's, there's always this process of kind of distilling, <laughs> distilling the mess messiness of reality down to a political message. Um, and that always involves, you know, some level of misrepresentation, deception. And, you know, for a very long time, you know, population, you know, populations that were illiterate were easy to steer that way populations that only had top-down media you know were able to steer that way you know a population that has you know bottoms up media is basically impossible to steer that way yeah um and so there's this like mismatch between the sort of you know which you might call sort of top-down uh, sort of simplified messaging uh or you know more cynically lies um you know and then the, the, the ability to kind of sustain authority when, when people can really question it in detail um, and so it's it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit as been your point on inflation it's a little bit like the public health mentality has sort of infected many other fields um, of sort of governmental and authority communication and, and, and economics is now one of those also and like they will just yeah they will just like flat out say things that just are like visibly not true and then they get very upset when they're called on it because they're like wait a minute we're the authorities we are supposed to distill this down so the masses will follow like how dare you question us and then you get you get this sort of you know, sort of you know rise in in, in, in let's say tension slash anger uh, on both sides. Yeah, and actually, it's going to be very interesting to see how that phenomenon plays out. So, you know, on the optimistic side for for this country, okay, now we're going to get closer. The truth is going to be out there. It's certainly not going to be completely hidden. And so they, the old Abe Lincoln thing, if you can, you know, fool some of the people all the time, like maybe you can't even do that anymore. Um, but then, uh, you know, like other countries, Russia, China, are taking the up. They are trying to lock it down so that there is not bottoms up media that's not at least heavily, heavily censored. And, right. you know, how does that model end up evolving versus the model of uh, more central control, uh, at least of, of thinking and information and the interpretation of the world? You know, how does that play out? Yeah. It's an open question. Yeah, my, my guess, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens in a more, more authoritarian societies, but uh, mm -hmm. my guess is in at least Western societies with relatively open access to information, um, it will just be impossible for, it will just be impossible for most centralized authorities to retain respect in the eyes of the people over the next decade. It's just, you know, the numbers, you know, the numbers, and the numbers for some institutions, I mean, specifically Congress and the press, you know, the numbers are like entering now single digits, a percentage. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, they show all every indication that they're going to go to zero. Um, and so you're, you're going to just have, you're going to have generations of people now who just don't buy what's being sold. And, and again, just to kind of bring it back to our day job, you know, th th this should be therefore prime time for the construction of new institutions that actually gain and, and justify and deserve trust. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, new, new kinds of entrepreneurial ventures in, you know, in, in the most important fields of all in fields like, you know, education, healthcare. The press <laughs> and the press, right? Like yes, yes, yes. Media. Yes, and information, inf information journalism, exactly. Um, which is obviously happening in real time, right? There's, there's, there's entirely new journalistic voices that uh, have a, have a, have a, uh, have, have, you know, completely different levels of trust from maybe the, the, the incumbent. So, um, 
Okay, well, we'll keep going. Um, let's see. Okay, and actually, this is actually it's actually kind of related to that. So Daniel asks, how have our cities evolved in the post-COVID world? And Ben, you know I'm a radical on this concept so, or this question, so why don't you start? Well, some cities have evolved and others have devolved. <laughs> um, so, you know, one of the things that happened during COVID, so you, you had the lockdowns, um, but you also had this... Uh, kind of two movements one was a defund the police movement and then the other was a um uh, kind of i hesitate to call it criminal justice reform because you know there are multiple schools of criminal justice of reform um, but this specific one was something called restorative justice uh which basically um really raised the kind of threshold of what you would prosecute. So like very few things, uh, you know, if you're a restorative justice DA, get prosecuted. And so many of the major cities had um, the combination of lockdowns, um, restorative justice, and defund the police. And that combination uh, just made it very, very hard for your normal city uh, entrepreneur who owned a restaurant or a retail store or, you know, a bodega or anything like that um, to stay in business because, you know, first, you know, we're going to not let you open your store. <laughs> and then once you open it, it's going to be totally cool for anybody to rob you. And they're definitely, not only are we not going to arrest them, but even if we did arrest them, we're not going to prosecute them. Um, and so as a result, I think in a lot of major cities, just the way the cities have have worked has changed. I know that's the case in San Francisco, which is kind of the closest city to us, where like the restaurant scene has really changed um, since COVID. And then retail, like shopping, just kind of is gone. That the major mall in San Francisco um, is just gone. <laughs> they were like, I'm out. Uh, and so that's really different. And you know, it means you know, kind of, it's a huge boon for Amazon, of course, uh, and other kind of online retail sorts of things, but it's it's changed, I think, the fabric, the community aspects of the city, the, uh, you know, who can earn a living in a city uh, has really kind of moved a lot uh, in, in many cities, not all cities. Some cities um, recovered very nicely from COVID and, you know, are thriving and vibrant and all that kind of thing, but but it's been it's been weird. What's your sense of um, the commercial real estate situation in cities, specifically with respect to employers and with respect to all of these big employers that are still grappling with the aftermath of, you know, the shift remote work and whether they get people back to the office and whether they need as much square footage and right, because that also bears like in places like, you know, San Francisco as an example, but many others. I mean, there's also this like great it, well, actually Washington, D.C. has a very potent case of this because a lot of federal agencies did never went back to work. Yeah, it's just like this kind of hollowing out of the actual populations, like the, especially like the daytime populations of the city centers and the business sectors is just like the, the, the buildings are empty. And then it, and then, you know, there's there's the employer question on that, which is what do we do and what do we want and so forth. And then there's the commercial real estate side of it, which is what are those buildings going to be filled with, if anything, in, you know, in, in five years. And then there's the city thing which is if you're a restaurant owner or a retailer, are there even customers? Yeah, so, I th and again, I, I do think it's very different in different cities. Um, you know, I, like, you, you know, j just apartments in New York City are totally crowded and going for very high rents and so forth. And um, and I imagine, like, if there are all those people living in apartments, there's got to be people going into the office. You know, it's kind of. But what about is that true of Midtown? Is that true of Mid Midtown Manhattan? Uh, so, you know, Midtown Manhattan's not the hottest of the areas. I think the hottest areas are downtown and Soho and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah. it's still like, you know, given, you know, New York. City and New York State lost a tremendous number of residents. I think they're kind of the second most uh, kind of people moving out other than uh, California and San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, so, so that I just say that, that that's interesting. Um, I mean, what we've seen in San Francisco is it's very hard to get people back in the office. And, you know, a lot of people during COVID actually moved not only out of the city, but out of the state. And, uh, you know, we haven't seen a lot of companies 
you know, other than Elon at Twitter go like, you have to come back um, or you're gone like that, that. That's the one kind of big case, but most of them have been okay with it. And rents have gone down, but not that much. And then, you know, there's kind of this commercial real estate loan cycle, which I think has everybody nervous who, you know, <laughs> who has money uh, in anything um, or is a resident of anything. I mean, you know, it's huge amount of kind of commercial debt, you know, kind of against commercial real estate coming due. And if there aren't people in those buildings, that's a real problem. Um, and I don't know, you know, I'm not up to speed enough on that, but like, I, I do think it's a, you know, there could be, there hasn't been a, a massively abrupt change um, in terms of like rents falling, uh, but you know, the, the, that could, it could happen. Residential rents or commercial rents or both? Commercial, e either. I mean, it, it's not, I mean, like uh, residential rents in San Francisco had been going straight up and then they kind of flattened and dropped. Um, but not, you know, they'd fall off a cliff. It didn't, yeah. you know, you can't like, why it's not like what happened in Detroit, you know, where houses right. go for five grand and that kind of thing. But if you go to like, if you go to midtown Manhattan or downtown Washington, DC and the federal, you know, or you go to, uh, you know, LA, I don't know, downtown or, you know, financial district, whatever, yeah. um, in five years, like, is, do you have a thing where it's like, oh, like everybody, you know, the, the, the offices have been refilled and everybody's out to lunch every day. Um, and you kind of have the city functioning the way that it used to from a business standpoint an occupancy standpoint, or do you have a, wow, like we have these like increasingly like blasted out cores and, you know, maybe some buildings are being converted to condos, but a lot of buildings are just sitting empty. Like what, what, what would you guess of, of how it tips? Well, I, I'd say I'm most worried about the, the malls, <laughs> um, and yeah. the kind of shopping districts. Like, I think it's so hard to have, um, you know, kind of any kind of shopping and particularly if the goods are high value, uh, you know, like, a whatever rodeo drive like yeah. it's hard to imagine rodeo drive ever being the same because you know and la has one of these restorative justice da's so like you know you get into a situation as a retailer where you've got yeah i mean they're selling purses that cost whatever twenty thousand fifty thousand dollars and then the security guards are not allowed to stop people from like breaking in and stealing stuff and the police will not arrest the thieves and the prosecutors will not press like how do you stay open in that scenario like it's not even like viable and so you know and then there's you know grocery stores have very similar issues where like you know they, 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 there's kind of a running joke like the, the, the criminals are all out free but the toothpaste is behind bars <laughs> um and and that is kind of being increasingly true so i don't know i mean like like i think shopping you know in-person shopping is probably the most the the scariest of all of them you know restaurants they get broken into there's not that much to steal um i think the biggest problem restaurants have right now is just getting people to take those jobs like for whatever reason people don't want to do that kind of work anymore or many people don't want to do that kind of work anymore let me ask you this. Um, I'm in LA right now. What, yeah. what, like, what do you think the true, like, what's the difference? Back to your, like, our observation we're making on trust in institutions um, and, you know, relating directly to the future of a city like LA. Like, what, what do you think is the difference between the reported crime rate in LA and the true crime rate where crimes, meaning like violent crimes, yeah. robberies, assaults, muggings? Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a very big delta in most major cities right now. Um, just because, yeah, they're, like if you're a police officer, well, I know in San Francisco, like so many people will call the police and the police will tell them like, you know, we can't, you know, you voted such that we cannot, somebody broke into your house. Great. We're not going to come over there and look at it because, you know, somebody broke into your car. Sorry, you know, keep your windows rolled down and don't leave anything in there. That's what you need to do. Not, and so they, right. You know, first, so there's a kind of cascade of that, like, you know, does the crime get written up? Do the people report the next crime, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so I, I think there, there's a pretty big difference. I, I wouldn't presume to be able to estimate it. I think in other cities, you know, look, in Las Vegas, the police respond. 
um, and you know, generally, uh, you know, they, they, they don't do that. They don't do the thing the San Francisco police do. Um, so the reporting is, is probably much closer in, in Las Vegas, which still, you know, has a fair amount of crime. I mean, what I've heard from people in the field, you know, like, like, uh, people in, in, gov- in local governments and to work on this is, um, like the murder rate is usually pretty correctly measured. Yeah. Um, because for two reasons, number one, it's a big deal when somebody gets killed and number two, yeah. there's a body and yeah. like it, it, the authorities tend to find out about it. Um, uh, but, uh, non, non murder violent crimes are much harder to count because you have no idea how many times they happen and they're just never reported. Yeah. I think that's probably right. I, I think that's right. Well, you know, one of the big things that's changed in talking to many police officers is like grand theft auto is no longer a thing. Like, if you steal right. a car, you don't get prosecuted in almost any state. Um, certainly right. in any blue state, you're not getting prosecuted for stealing a car. Um, and then you combine that with, you know, this kind of this funny thing um, where the left is like, well, let's sue Hyundai for making the cars that are too easy to steal. Um, and then the right going like, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. But like, I think the truth is actually somewhere in the middle in that, you know, there are these TikTok videos that teach you how to steal a car. And then if you have a prosecutor, if the people have voted in a DA that won't prosecute car theft, then that it becomes a huge problem, you know? And so then what do you do? You either have to vote in a new DA or you have to get Hyundai to like not make their car so easy to steal. So it's, it is a really weird situation. I have to do my Jim Downey little comedy routine, which is, you know, TikTok, you know, not surely not that Chinese app where people share makeup tips. <laughs> they would, they wouldn't, they wouldn't allow videos on like how to steal a car. That would yeah. never happen. Never. <laughs> Particularly not a Korean car. <laughs> Outstanding. Yeah. Um, so then let me, cl- let me close this topic on one, on, on one big question I, I think about a lot, which has to do with the post-COVID world. So there was this critique during COVID from some quarters, which kind of goes as follows, which is, you know, whatever, whatever, however you got to the policies, you got to whatever. The effect of the policies was basically a massive uh, wealth transfer, income transfer, opportunity transfer from sort of normal, say, normal people um, to what gets pre- pejoratively called the laptop class, mm-hmm. um, uh, of which, of course, we are in, in the laptop class here. We sit on our laptops. Um, yeah. And so it's like this massive transfer of like, you know, if I mean, it started out with just basic COVID lockdown policies, yeah. which is the laptop class all got sent home. It was the quote unquote essential workers mm-hmm. who are blue collar workers uh, and service workers, low income service workers who had to keep working, who got hit, you know, who got hit with COVID, you know, hardest in the first yeah, place. When the when um, pain was the most deadly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it started with that. And then to your point, it was this massive shift from sort of normal offline businesses like corner stores um, to online re- retailing, which is dominated by a small number of very big companies yep. um, like like Amazon. And then, you know, and then, by the way, a shift again from, you know, the, the rise of, of video conferencing. And so the shift from like, you know, hotels like, you know, half the hotels in the country are, are, are owner operated. You know, there's a lot of small business hotel owners and all of a sudden everything just went online. Um, and so kind of in, in, in category after category of economic activity, the result of the policies was to basically shift a huge amount of wealth from, from the off, sort of the offline class, sort of regular people to the, to, to the online class, the upper middle class online class. And then the nature of the laptop class, um, is, you know, the upper middle class is sort of the most, the most, the most divorced from day to day life generally, um, you know, just due to high incomes. And then specifically if they're at home and their laptops all day, they're really divorced by what's happening in the real world. Like, do, do you buy that as a, like, how does that critique resonate with you like you know four or five years later so i think that's general generally right i do think that so i'd add two things one in each direction one is um travel has kind of come back quite a bit it's not quite where it was but it, it's very close so i i, I think you know, certainly not ghost towns in the hotels currently they're they're starting to you know be lively again um the other kind of giant factor was the the other thing that happened during COVID, of course, was uh, inflation. Um, and, you know, and which may or may not have been caused by the fact that we printed more money since 2009 than we did in the whole rest of the country's history combined. Um, that may have been a factor, but, you know, who knows? Um, <laughs> you're not allowed to talk about that in polite society. So that 
you know, inflation is probably the single biggest transfer of wealth from uh, the the regular person who kind of has their assets in cash and the wealthy person who has their assets in stocks, real estate, you know, kind of things that uh, inflate, um, you know, like the asset inflation has actually been much more severe than price inflation. And, you know, meanwhile, you have your money in dollars, you're just getting poorer and poorer and poorer. So I think that's, uh, you know, been a real thing and in the, in the, the kind of very dangerous thing for society when that kind of thing happens, when, you know, your policies start to transfer money from the poor to the rich at increasing rates of speed. I think that's very bad in general. Yeah, it feels like this might be one of the big underlying trends in our politics um, and the, in the rise of sort of more extreme forms of populism on both sides of the political spectrum, which is you just have a large number of people who are sort of maybe they can't explain all of this, but like they're generally aware and they feel it. Um, yeah, I mean, and they feel it, you know, yeah. I mean, the fact that you that, you know, the proposition of going to college and buying a house 20 years ago is so radically different today. Um, like it's yeah. almost if you didn't somehow grow up with money, those two things seem impossible now. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a result of kind of asset inflation on the one hand, and then this, uh, kind of huge incentives that we've given to universities to increase tuition, um, with no, you know, kind of normally if you increase prices, you know, that affects demand. It doesn't affect demand if the government, um, is willing to, lend you them lend you the money <laughs> uh, and then you know perhaps uh forgive that loan and then so the right the, for a normal person who or for a person who's like okay if i go to college I either have to have the money or pay the loan back if that's your mindset you know and you didn't grow up with money you're not going to college so that that's a, a huge 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 problem yeah and then i don't know you could add also healthcare. i, I think this is the case but um one of the dramatic cases in healthcare, uh, dramatic changes in healthcare economics, even before COVID, was the the rise of the the rise of the size of the, of the deductible. Yeah. Um, like, like that was the big surprise I think coming out of the Affordable Care Act for a lot of people, which is like, oh my God! Like in addition to like all this, you know, and, uh, all of a sudden now the deductibles, you know, my deductible used to be fifty bucks, now it's fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, and now that's the kind of thing again where like rich, you know, upper middle class people are not going to feel it, um, uh, or not feel it nearly as much, but normal people are going to like the minute they get exposed to health healthcare system, they get that bill, they're just get it's just like a slap across the face. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it, it's funny, all every government program is named the opposite thing that it is, right? The Affordable <laughs> Care, <laughs> Care Act was the Unaffordable Care Act, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act was the Inflation Cause Re Act, you know, like it's just, it is so weird. We, we do live in a Pravda world. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we do, or at least Alice in Wonderland. Okay, uh, we have a fantastic question. This is actually a very broad question, um, but uh, it certainly has its, its, its post-COVID elements, but I love every part of it. So um, we can go step by step. But M MT asks, uh, when do you think the following vestiges of the previous industrial age will disappear? And yeah. I'm going to just list, he lists five questions and I'm going to, I'll, I'll, I'll list them and then we'll, we'll go one by one. So the 40 hour work week, um, number one. Number two, talent recruiting universities. Yeah. Um, number three, HR departments. Uh, number four, corporate headquarters. Um, meaning, I think physical physical facilities. Yeah. Um, and then number five, number five, single CEO leadership. Um, yeah. So let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And let's you know again put these in the put these you know we we talk about these topics both generally but also specifically you know what was changing yeah. now so in this in this new in this new upside down world so okay let's start with forty hour work weeks Ben what is your prognosis for the forty hour work week. So it's interesting. I think it's gone in most places that aren't connected to the government, right? Like, so in our world, there's, there's no 40 hour. Work. I mean, what's your, like, the, I feel like the work week at our firm and it's not imposed at all, but like is closer to 60 or 70 hours um, than 40 hours, uh, you know, for most of our people, not all of them, you know, depending on what the job is. And then, uh, you know, certainly for restaurant workers, it's not, it tends not to be 40 hours. Um, you, you either work a shorter shift or, you know, you're a manager or something and work a, a longer kind of time. Um, and then, you know, I, I think most jobs are not 
quite like that, although there are, um, well, many jobs aren't like that. I mean, the things that keep it that way are, so if you're a, uh, whatever, an exempt um, or a non-exempt worker, then, you know, you have these labor laws that say you need overtime or, you know, pay if you work over 40 hours a week. So there's all these kind of maneuvers that people do to not have you work 40 hours a week, which, you know, maybe you want to work 60 hours a week because you'd like the money, um, but that, that becomes implausible and they'll just add workers and that kind of thing. Um, so, <laughs> or, or, or robots. Yeah. So I, 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 and then, you know, government jobs are 40 hours a week. Um, and then anything the government touches seems to be 40 hours a week. So, so it's really a government imposed thing at this point, uh, as opposed to a capitalism imposed thing. And I think that as long as you have a department of labor, uh, you know, because the Department of Labor itself is a very industrial age idea. So I think to get rid of the 40 hour work week entirely, you have to get rid of the Department of Labor because that's the kind of entity that's enforcing it. And we saw this, you know, like weirdly with AB5. So one of the things that like modern people liked a lot about the gig economy was, okay, I'm my own boss. I work when I need money. I don't work when I don't need money. It's like, Great. And I just press a button on the app and I get work and away I go. The department or like uh, the, in California, at least they sort of outlawed that. And I think in Minnesota, maybe they just outlawed that as well um, because they want people to work 40 hour weeks. Um, so it, it, it's not a market function. It's a government function. And I don't, you know, it's the, these, the, the politics of it are hard to, to predict. Yeah, there's been this massive cultural shift um, and sort of the sort of social on the socially progressive side of things, which is, you know, there was this kind of iconic movie of the late 60s called The Graduate yeah, uh, with Dustin Hoffman. And the whole kind of theme of The Graduate, which is very consistent with the, 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 the era, was basically the worst thing in the world that you could possibly end up as is as a corporate drone 40 hour a week, plastics. you know. Mm. plastic yeah plastics mm -hmm. you're, you're yeah the famous line in the movie yeah is uh the the, uh, the uncle of the the dustin hoffman character who's graduating i guess college um uh, or whatever um he walks over and says you know i have one word uh you know to give you and it's plastics you know you should go into the plastic industry but of course you know the underlying meaning also was you you, you become plastic you're going to go to work for a big plastics company and you're going to work 40 hours a week for 30 years and you're going to get a gold watch and you're going to hate every minute of it but like that's nah. you know and in and, and the movie the whole point of the movie and I, I i won't spoil the ending for people who haven't seen a movie older than i am yeah. um but uh, the whole point of the movie is you know he, he's rebelling against this life of basically being a corporate drone 40 hour a week you know basically um you know they sort of present it as if it's like one step away from slavery yeah. um and so it went for you know and of course what you're supposed to do the message of the movie you're supposed to rebel and you're supposed to be creative and live an independent life and you know follow your muse and you know kind of you know flower, let your personality flower and you know figure mm -hmm. out some other way to way to live and so 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 the but the the sort of philosophy the sort of value system went all and, and went all the way from that all the way to no you must live that life um you must live that life it is you know the employers must provide that life you must work yes. 40 hours a week and not 41 or 39 you know you must be a drone you must be a cog in the machine and if you're not that basically like something has gone wrong and you're being you know let down and betrayed and so it's a weird it's a weird inversion and yeah for people who don't follow it at least in states like california with extremely aggressive states departments of labor um <laughs> Yeah, you just you have this thing where they're just like extre there's like ex extremely punishing consequences um, if you have uh, an employee. You, you, you can have managers who are on salary, but basically it's it's become very difficult for a lot of employers in California to have just like regular working people who are on salary. Um, and so they they shove you hard into this uh, hourly thing. Even even in, in many cases, employees don't want it and they actually resent it. Um, and they you know resent having to clock in and clock out and track their time. And they resent the fact that they're not a full member of the team and they're not being treated like a professional, but they're required to do that in the Department of Labor right. will. As, a, as an employee, you cannot opt out. So like, I want to go take this job. I want to work. I want to build this thing. I want to contribute as much as I can. I want to get, you know, in line for bonuses, stock options, promotions, all that. And the government literally says, no, you can't. Um, because we don't think that's a good job, even though they know nothing about the job and you must work 40 hours a week and, you know, 
uh, fill out a time card and get paid for overtime if you're, you know, a minute over that and all that kind of thing, which is uh, kind of a very weird situation. Yeah. Not and then the, the, the sort of that comes from, yeah, yeah, for sure. It's all government imposed. Yeah. And then the on onerousness of that and the lack of flexibility coupled with, you know, rises in minimum wage laws um, and other other sort of late labor uh, things, it, of course, is a giant incentive for employers to implement automation um, and, and just, you know, take, take out the jobs entirely. And so, of course, you see that in the restaurant industry right now where there's yeah. a big push to get kiosks into all the fast food restaurants precisely to be able to eliminate the workers. Um, and it's not like anybody at those companies thought, you know, woke up one morning and decided, wow, it'd be great if we could get rid of all these people. It was, yeah. more, you know, a lot of people who in those businesses actually really value being able to work with, you know, young people and kind of help them develop. And, and you know, they'd rather be in a restaurant, be, you know, with other workers than be the, by themselves with a bunch of machines. But, yeah. the, you know, the economics are pushing a lot of these companies uh, towards, you know, to get as automated, machine driven as possible and then wiping out entire tiers of jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Which is really unfortunate because, you know, the, the fast food industry, you know, for whatever you think about it has always been a great place. Like if you grow up in, um, kind of, if you grow up poor in America, like there's a few, there's many things working against you, but one of them is, um, you know, you're, you may be in a culture where like showing up, um, on time, like, and kind of knowing the, whatever norms of, working society are just unknown to you. You may like live in a place where most people work in the shadow economy, which is, has a different set of culture and norms. And so fast food had, has historically been a bridge to that. So you will come in and get trained on like basically how to enter the workforce. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of tier of the system is going away. Uh, I think very, very fast. I mean, California now, I think they raised the minimum wage for fast food over the regular minimum wage, which is kind of a weird idea, like to twenty dollars an hour, because you know it's mostly teenagers working in fast food. <laughs> like, right. Yeah, it's not like, and when you talk to the people, like you know, I used to be, or I am friends with the former CEO of McDonald's, and he was like, like, we're not trying to hire forty-five year old people with five kids to work at McDonald's. Like, this is a job for teenagers to learn, enter the workforce, and. You know, I think at McDonald's, something like 60 or 80% of the franchise ease, the owners of McDonald's restaurants started as hourly employees. So it's a, there's actually a nice progression and all that kind of thing, but uh, not anymore. You know, the other question to ask on this, which also goes back to the, when we, we have still topics coming up on the work from home stuff, but um, uh, <laughs> so here's the other question. This is sort of my, my put my cynical, cynical hat on. So so Ben, in a typical corporate environment um, with a 40 hour work week, then, so let's not, you know, the fast food restaurant, you're covering shifts and you have customers and so forth and so and you clock in and so people know when you're there. But let's say a typical corporate job where you're in an office and you're, you know, whatever doing, you know, corporate things. Um, and, uh, you know, again, you're sort of on, on, a, on a computer most of the day um, or in meetings most of the day. Like how many hours were, how many hours a week was the average corporate worker actually working? pre-COVID, like in, in terms of actual productive work as contrasted to, you know, all of the Circling the internet. web. Are, are you asking about me personally? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like what, what was the actual productive, like if you're a CEO of a, of a big company and you're doing honest assessment of your white collar workforce in 2019, like how, how many hours of productive work a week were you actually getting? Yeah. I mean, I think it's tricky, right? Because on the, um, you know, on the high end, you're probably getting certainly over 40 hours. Um, and on the low end, you know, you might have been getting getting like four hours. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I think it depends a lot on the company, the company culture, the level of accountability and so forth. So if you have a place like, you know, a very low accountability culture, like say a Google, which, you know, has a monopoly that kind of supports the other businesses. So it's hard to have accountability when there's like a single profit center that dominates to that degree. Um, then it, the number is probably quite low. Uh, and, you know, and then you add work from home from that and all these kinds of things and it gets like super low. I think on the other hand, if you're in a company that's fighting for its life or there's super high accountability and they're seeing if, you know, every job is necessary and so forth, then you're probably much higher. 
there are government agencies I won't I won't name, um, but there are government large government agencies where I believe they now have employee employee bargaining uh, agreements that have been struck, um, and you know they they often have so, you know civil service um, and sometimes unions and so forth. Um, uh, but I think there are government uh, domestic government agencies where they're they are only now required to be in the office four days a week. Um, this is a big topic in Washington because this has led to this has led to you know, it's a significant hollowing out of the of the so, so the whole Capitol Hill area because um, yeah. literally employees just don't come to the office anymore. And so, if you have a government bureaucracy where people are working are in the office four days a week, like <laughs> how, how many hours, how many hours, uh, uh, how many hours a week are they actually working? Like, yeah, yeah, that's uh, well, and you know, it's not just a government bureaucracy, but you can't be fired. And then there yes. are really strict rules around advancement, right? You know, yeah. advancement has much more to do with tenure and your, like, literally your racial and gender demographic than it does, you know, any of the work that you do, just because that's where the government works right now. So it's, yeah, I, look, we, uh, I, I, I don't want to get, political but like the bang for the buck that we get out of government services has been uh, uh uninspiring lately so the reason i bring it up is because i think so tell me what you think of this i think that there's a critique there's a critique you often hear and you hear it from ceos in particular um and you know kind of business thinkers and it's sort of like oh people are less productive working from home um they just they're working fewer hours they're goofing off more um you know that we need to get them back in the office to get them back to like working the full full you know yeah. full the full time um m- my view is that's actually a fake problem um that that, that that the real problem was they weren't working hard to begin with um and they were goofing off 20 hours a week in the office already um and um and so yeah they're goofing off at home but they were goofing off in the office too and you just didn't see it because you thought that they were you know you would look out at the cubicle farm and it looked like everybody was working but they weren't and of course my support for my cynical view on this is all of the usage data from all the consumer internet companies which shows you know huge usage between eight o'clock and five o'clock Monday through Friday <laughs> Yeah, you know, in each local time zone, um, our our friend Jonah Peretti used to refer to this as he called it the uh, what, what was it? Um, it was the uh, oh the uh, the at work network. Yeah, um, you know, it's consumer internet services that are basically like you know they're they're the prime the prime usage is literally through five Monday through Friday while people are at work because that's when they just like sit on the computer all day. Yeah, uh, like and so it, it, it is my view. Like, does that does that sound right? Um, uh, and, and therefore CEOs that think if they get people back in the office, they're going to get a productivity boost are actually fooling themselves or is that, is that too cynical? Well, um, I, I, I agree that like people were wasting lots of time while in the office, uh, as well. I do think that, um, if you, it just depends, like what is your accountability for like work output, like how do you like look at that think about that and um you know measure that understand that and so forth and if your only way of doing that is like literally walking by people's desks and popping in and go what are you working on then you know obviously working from home is going to potentially create a job drop off because like a zero accountability on that on the other hand if the work output you know for an engineer or whatever is like, okay, like how many pull requests you have, like what's the quality of your code and so forth. You know, that's a different kind of measure and it's a lot more independent of where you are physically. Uh, and then there's a lot of stuff at work that is work or feels like work, but isn't productive. Like there's many meetings, you know, that are like that and so forth. So I think, you know, if you're running an organization, you just probably have to think a little bit harder about some of these questions than you did when you had everybody together. Uh, but yeah, there, there's obviously, I mean, you know, what the net is, it's, it's hard to say. Well, the reason I bring it up is because, and I'm glad you brought this up. You brought up, I think, the key underlying point, which is how do you actually measure output? Um, like, how do you actually measure productivity? And if you're in a factory, you measure it by which it's produced. And if you're in a McDonald's, you register, you know, you measure it by number of Big Macs sold and so forth. Um, if you're in a lot of office environments, actually, it's a, a lot of knowledge work is actually very hard to measure uh, output. And the, the reason I bring it up is because the, the it, as, as the generative AI revolution hits white collar work, you know, over the next five years, uh, like, I suspect... Let me put it this way. A, a reason for bullishness on AI in the workplace is I suspect it may be easier than it looks to replace a lot of white collar work because it may just be that a lot of white collar work actually wasn't 
actually all that complicated or all that deep or all that, um, you know, didn't actually require that much time. Like there actually wasn't as much there as people thought. And it's relatively easy to replace the email jobs. Um, yeah, I think that's probably correct. The, the other one, like, um, which won't change the number of jobs because that would be illegal, but that is potential. It's just bureaucratic work, right? Like pushing paper. Uh, you know, I mean, we had, we had the episode on higher ed, but you know, the fact that higher ed has more administrators than students um, is so crazy. Like, like you, you know, when you say it, you can't believe it. And like, do they need any? <laughs> right? Do they, or like, is this a job for AI? Um, and it seems like a job for AI. Yeah. So we'll maybe come, come back to that in future episodes, because uh, I think that's a very interesting topic. Okay. Speaking universities, uh, uh, second part of our question, uh, when do you think the following vestiges of the previous industrial age will disappear? Uh, ban talent recruiting at universities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We are, uh, it's a special day for us to record this podcast because I've been teasing Ben all day because he was on the board of Columbia for a long time and the yeah. uh, president and board of trustees of Columbia just got lit up in front of Congress uh, today. And I keep reminding him that in, on Earth 2, he's the chair of the board of Columbia and he was uh, spent all day getting yelled at. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> so. Earth 417. It's a far away uh, prospect. <laughs> so, talent recruiting at universities. Yeah, th that's an interesting one. I mean, I think that, um, y you know, we did that. There's no question that our education system is getting very, very out of date, um, you know, and w we went through that in detail. But, like, one of the biggest things for me is um, what you need to be effective in the workforce is not just very dynamic, but... Um, you know, you kind of need to be educated your whole life. Uh, and so to take out four years, and maybe high school falls in this category too, by the way. Like once you get to be like 13, <laughs> um, I think you'd probably be much better off with a portion of your life being education, a portion of your life being, you know, productive work. And the, the reason being is like, Productive work and the nature of productive work is changing so rapidly now that, you know, kind of being in the mode of and just having the expectation for everyone that you're going to continue to learn new things and do new stuff as opposed to I'm going to go away for four years to a university and have no productivity and I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff that very likely to be, you know, potentially outdated uh, very quickly. I mean, you know, and, you know, it used to be like things have always gotten outdated. Like you and I learned the Dewey Decimal System. I don't think anybody learns that anymore, um, which is like actually a kind of a complicated system. Uh, but, you know, everything is like that now. And, and, the, and the main thing is like, you know, it's going to be like, can you uh, interact with, AI in a productive way? Can you interact with the internet in a productive way? And can you learn new things? And the people who can learn new things have unlimited job prospects. And the people who can't learn new things are, you know, like, even if you went to college, I don't think it matters. So, you know, I, I think society is starting to rethink that. I think college admissions or college applications are way down this year. Um, so I think people are starting to realize, okay, college is clearly not worth the money. That's why the student loan debt. Um, you know, that we have to forgive because like, I can't get a job that can ever pay back what I spent on this university. Uh, and so then how are people going to get ready for the workforce? And I got to think that like, there's going to be a lot of innovation along those lines. I mean, just a company that like looked at the jobs that are available and gave you like a self-directed study way to be ready for them and then educated employers on how to, you know, look in non-traditional places for those employees would be a miracle company. Yeah. You know, I think we can get ourselves another YouTube strike here um, by coming yeah. off for child labor. Um, yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's true too. I'll just say, I'll just say, <laughs> in support I, mean, of what I, mean, like, I mean, having raised uh, three teenagers, I, I, I'll just say that I think child labor is a good idea um, <laughs> and not, not like eight year olds, but look, once you become an adult, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, in adult 
physiologically. Like, so once you cross puberty, yeah. Yeah. You, you know, like it's pretty, you, you are like at that point, um, in many ways, smarter than your parents. Uh, but you let, you're living under this very, uh, restrictive regime that they control. And the reason that you're living under that restrictive regime is that you are very smart, but you don't have to live with the consequences of any of your decisions because you don't have to work or be productive or do anything. So like you can go, you know, get in your car drunk and like, you know, run into, you know, run people over and all that, like all, all the things that teenagers do that like we try and, you know, contain adolescence over, you know, we might not have those issues if they were also kind of getting into society at that point and starting to work and do some things and not just, you know, whatever studying, you know, history and algebra and all these, you know, kind of techniques that uh, we think are so important, but like probably aren't as important as starting to integrate into society. Yeah, well, the, the whole the whole construction uh, historically, the whole construction of adolescence is new. Like, it's not; it's a very modern sort of post nineteen hundred concept. Um, you know, basically, ev right? Every society basically pre nineteen hundred would have thought that that, that this whole thing is good. Yeah, whole you're definitely like working on the farm, <laughs> probably well before. Yeah. Before, yeah. Yeah, you're going straight to work or you're, yeah, you're, I mean, it's just like th this idea that you're physically an adult and mentally a child and, and live, yeah. live, at, at, you know, and don't have the rights and privileges of it. Like the, it, previous societies would have just all just considered this yeah. completely ludicrous. And then, by the way, they, they would have looked at the dysfunction of teenage life, um, you know, with all of the problems that everybody likes to talk about, about how, you know, dysfunctional and screwed up teenagers are. You know, they would have looked at that. And, they, and the, any previous society would look at, look at that and said, well, obviously it's because you're treating them like children. You need to treat them like, a, like, like adults. Like th this is crazy. Uh, I would just say also in support of, 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 of the idea of, of child labor, uh, I, you know, look, I worked, you know, I worked for, I worked 40 hours a week, basically from the age of 13. And, um, and by the way, I would just say completely voluntarily. Yeah. Um, I, that's what I, uh, like my parents had forced me to where oh, I wanted to get a job. Yeah. You know, and it was right. the same jobs you had probably, you know, paper boy, yep. dishwasher, you know, bellhop, <laughs> like yeah. kinds of things, you know, that were around, you know, that, that they, minimum wage. <laughs> Yeah. So like, yeah, by the time I graduated college, I had been basically working for it hours a week for 10 years and yeah. right in both, right. In both blue collar jobs and then later in, in knowledge work jobs, you know, programming jobs and so forth in college. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, yeah, this is, you know, maybe a no brainer, but maybe, you know, like the Waterloo co-op, you know, the Waterloo university of Waterloo co-op model or something is the, uh, you know, is it, you know, makes much more sense, which is you just, you just integrate work into education at a much, at a much, at a much earlier point, but okay. Yep. Um, we can keep going. Um, all right. I, I cause I'm in dying. We got to leave time for this one. So, uh, <coughs> HR departments. So HR, you know, this is another, I think, um, so there, there, there's two parts of HR. There's a government imposed, um, part of HR, which is a very, very large, uh, kind of thing. Um, which, y you know, it is an industrial revolution idea. Um, and you know, it was, uh, what was it, the that book Upton Sinclair's book called? Um, the uh, oh, I can't remember the concrete, ju concrete yeah. jungle, or, or the, no, the um, it was the the meat packers, yeah, the meat packer book, oh, right. the, the horrible jobs, yeah, 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 was, yeah that but just, kind of created the horrible abuses, horrible abuses by employers, yes, yeah, so that created kind of labor regulation, um, and then that created uh, HR because if you have regulation, right. then you need somebody who understands the regulation and can help the company comply. So it's almost, you know, you need HR today, um, you know, or that whole part of HR, you can't run with HR be, without HR because you have to be compliant with a very large and complex set of regulations around labor laws. And yeah, you know, these cover everything from safe working conditions to sexual harassment to you know this and that and the other and it's all like and, so, and these civil rights specific the, civil rights yeah yeah the entire civil rights regime right all the yeah so i discrimination like, non-discrimination so i don't see how that or that can't go away without like some real big change in view on you know kind of how that ought to work um the other part of hr is I think a little more kind of optional, potentially strategic, you know, depending on how you think about it, which is more what I call kind of like management quality assurance. So 
are we, you know, in our recruiting practice, are we finding the best people? Are we running a good process? Are we closing candidates at a high rate? Once we close them, do we have employee satisfaction? If not, what groups suck? You know, that kind of thing. Just like, how do you know your managers are doing their job in terms of, you know, the environment that you create at work? And I think that that, um, you know, well, we'll get to like, okay, in an AI world, are all companies consist of one person? And in that case, I don't think, you know, that HR does go away. Um, <laughs> but short of that, I think, I think if you have large organizations or uh, government regulation around labor, then I, I'm not sure how HR actually goes away. Even though it is, it is a contract of the industrial revolution, farmers didn't have HR. <laughs> they right. just had kids. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Okay. So two, you identified two categories. So kind of legally necessary, uh, category yeah. number one. So compli compliance with all laws and regulations around labor, which continuously expand. So that it seems like it gets bigger over time. Um, two is the high value aspect of HR um, <laughs> that it, we would say in, enlightened CEOs want to have an advanced HR department for the purpose of working with them on management quality assurance and on, on sort of, you know, de developing, uh, developing the organization. Um, there is the third function, which is the other, the other direction, which is sort of ideological, political, you know, sort of, uh, uh, uh compliance, um, um, commissars. Um, right. And so a lot of the, when, when companies take on social That's objectives an inside the organization, function, right, right, right. Well, it's a lot of companies it's designed, right. It's desired, right. Uh, at, at a lot of companies, yeah, including a lot of big tech companies, it's HR has a charter to basically drive political and social change, um, and enforce that change yeah. very broadly yeah, inside the yeah, organization. Yeah, yeah. Right. 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 Yeah. Yep. <laughs> and becomes very, very strong, right? Like they have the tremendous power to like obliterate, you know, employees on contact if they get sideways with, you know, whatever is the prevailing kind of social vision or mission, you know, that management has decided to endorse. Yeah. So this is kind of, um, it's interesting because this is sort of the replacement of the religious right with the religious left. So you kind of go from, you know, and I do think that uh, if I recall correctly, like in the kind of first half of the century and then kind of into a little bit of our childhoods, like religion, specifically Christianity, was very kind of integrated into a lot of workplaces and, you know, like there's still some vestiges that would like, you know, football teams tend to do a Jesus prayer, uh, kind of before the game and that kind of thing. Um, and then that was kind of rooted out through kind of a lot of kind of legal proceedings and separation of church and state and this and that and third. And then, but look, people like that. <laughs> I mean, not all people, but the, you know, there's spirituality is a real thing. And so that as you kind of get rid of Christianity as a kind of fabric in society, like what's the new kind of spiritual bond amongst uh, the people. And I think that's become kind of the religious left, which is kind of more political in nature. And it's like equity and, um, you know, I guess, you know, recently stopped uh, the, the, the war in Gaza um, and, you know, whatever, the kind of moral high ground uh, as determined by the, you know, some branch of, of left-wing politics is. And then that gets adopted by HR in the same way that, you know, the church might have got adopted in the past. Uh, so, um, <laughs> you know, it has gone away. That part has gone away before. Um, and will it go away again? I don't know. Uh, it's really a tricky thing. I mean, my father used to always say, I remember uh, my friend Christopher Hitchens wrote a book called God is Not Great. And my father's criticism of that, he's like, look, you have two choices. You can believe in God or somebody who claims to be God. And I think we're in the, we're somebody who claims to be God category where, you know, people decide morality and morality, not just for themselves, but for a whole company or, you know, a whole organization. And that's, that, that, that that's how I interpret that one. So I would just say that that one I think could go away because it has gone away. But I, but I bring it up because I think you'd agree that HR becomes the enforcement arm um, for whatever those principles are in a lot of companies. Like that's how a lot of employees are experiencing HR. Yeah, yeah, no, I think so. And I and I think like HR in those cases also runs. They usually have some philanthropic arm that is uh, connects back through 
the practices in the company and so forth. Uh, I think that's all right. And I think it's, um, it, it, it does the same thing that, you know, like it would make you feel a little uncomfortable if you weren't Christian in one of those companies. And I think it makes you feel a little uncomfortable if you're not uh, of that more view of morality, uh, you know, in these yeah. companies. Well, I just bring it up because, you know, HR, the, the combination of those three functions is, it conveys incredible power, right? And so, I don't, because it only, because it's, and they're, they're, inter, it ends up being intertwined, right? Because oh, 100%. It's like, okay. Right, right. Like your, your, your performance review plus <laughs> your, you know, Car career path. Career path. Um, yeah. Do you, plus your, yeah. Your, your legal status and your moral status and your career status, yeah, you know, it, like it, I, I, as an HR, as an HR, per, if I'm an HR person and I want to really assert control of our company, it's like, yeah. look, I've got the law on my side. I've got your career in my hands and I can nuke you on social and moral grounds whenever I want. Like that's an incredibly powerful set of capabilities. And of course, I, I'm a staff function, so I don't have responsibility for business output. Yeah, I, I think I think in the extreme case, that's true. I think at, like at most of the companies that I'm involved with, uh, the HR function, function hasn't been elevated to that level of power where they're more powerful than the managers. I imagine as companies get bigger and bigger in size, then HR becomes more and more powerful as a, as a result of that. There was another society in the 20th century that had this model, and it was uh, Soviet communism, and they had a, a political commissar, and, and the Chinese have a CCP as a similar thing. And so every every manager in the Soviet system was paired with a political commissar uh, who sat next door and, you know, in theory was a staff person and in practice was actually in charge of everything. And if you remember the great movie, The Hunt for Red October, um, when, uh, when when Sean Connery decides to defect and take the submarine to the uh, to America, uh, the very first thing he does is, is take out the political commissar because yeah. that is, you know, would be the primary thing that would stop him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I do think we, it, it, it is a big company large institutions uh, uh, have, have, backed, have backed into a system that actually is very reminiscent of how the Soviets used to run things uh, with, with respect to this kind of par parallel control structure. And, and it, you, you kind of wonder, you know, you, yeah, you kind of wonder. I, you know, so, so the reason I, I go through all this is just it's like, okay, is that in these larger institutions, is, is, are, are, are those apparatuses now so powerful that they actually run the show and they can't be taken out? Or at some point, is there some sort of revolt either from the top or from the bottom where people are just like, this is just, I, I know, I'm, no, I'm no longer living, a, I'm no longer willing to live like this. Yeah. Well, I, look, I think it, I think it creeps in. Um, and so if it crossed the threshold, I imagine, you know, depending on who the CEO is, they may go, okay, that's too far. Um, but yeah, it, it slides in cause it's like, well, you know, we want to be for good. Like, like um, right. we want to do well and do good is probably a pretty dangerous phrase in retrospect in that, um, you know, you kind of want those things aligned. So whatever the company produces is going to make the world a better place like that. And you kind of want to stop it there. If it's like, okay, we're going to go get the money over here and then we're going to turn around over there and impose our morality on the world and that's doing good, then you probably are doing evil and evil. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're probably being like massively evil because you have no constraints on your business practices, which is a huge impact in the world. And then you're imposing your unaccountable morality, which is also a huge impact. And you're wrecking everything. So I, I think that that's, uh, you know, one of the worst phrases that's ever been invented um, in terms of it sounds so great and it's so bad. Yeah. Somebody once said virtue is more dangerous than vice because vice has a natural stopping point. It's yeah. when you or somebody around you realizes you're actually doing something horrible. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas virtue, virtue has no stopping point. Um, and it can just run, it can run into just like completely crazy uh, levels of, uh, and with, without, with everybody feeling like they can't challenge it. Yeah. Yeah. Completely berserk. Yeah. And uh, no, I think, yep. I think it's very important to be like aligned, uh, <laughs> ha have a consistent code that touches everything that you do, not, you know, isn't kind of separated like that in that way. So let's close on your favorite topic then, which is culture um, and culture in this new post COVID world. So we had three questions uh, that kind of all circle around this question. So Chris asks, how do you anticipate remote workers influencing the evolution of company culture? What specific strategies do you recommend for effectively adapting to this transformation? 
Um, Andrew asks, has remote work been the death of company culture? Uh, and if so, what can we do to get it back? And then HD Retrovision asks, remote work is great, but how do we make sure new graduates slash young talent won't lose out on in-person mentoring? What is your take on the best way to bring new talent into the fold in a remote environment? All right, which one do you want me to answer? <laughs> Well, yeah. So like I'm a CEO, you're to say you're, you're coaching and advising me and I'm a CEO and I'm one of these, you know, CEOs, midsize or large company. And I'm, I'm struggling with this. Like I'm, I, I have a sort of a default hybrid thing going on. Um, and I'd really like to get everybody back in the office, but I can't. Um, I'd really like to only hire new, you know, in person people, but I'm also still hiring remote people because they have skills um, that I want. And like, I, you know, my, my, and I can maybe get my people back in the office a couple of days a week or a few days a month, but like, I can't like all, all of the, all of the ways that I used to be with people. And we used to like, you know, all be together. And I used to, you know, give, give talks and perpetuate culture. It, you know, now I just find myself staring into a camera and hoping people are on the other side, listening to me. Like, <laughs> yeah. So like, you know, and I, and I, I worry, I worry that my culture is unraveling and I don't know how to pull it back together. Yeah. So I think that, um, so my big conclusion, you know, having done this kind of, you know, at the firm for the last few years is the hybrid thing makes certain things you get for free in terms of uh, cultural cohesion, like not free, like you have to design things in. Um, and kind of the, the, I think it's very important that when you do that or like, to be effective, if you have the constraints you talked about, if you aren't willing to do the Elon and just say everybody's got to be in the office, and I don't even know if they're in the office or not. He certainly said that. Um, then you have to decompose the problem. So in, in that, okay, different functions are different um, and different. So what, what do I mean that by that? Like, okay, so if you have, if you want a high quality engineering culture, uh, high quality engineering culture has the, the, there's a few things that like, I think are very common. You know, one is great communication so that you have very high fidelity understanding of how the entire code base works, the architecture, so forth. Um, so how do you do that in a remote environment? Um, and then there's like, okay, um, I feel like my work matters. And usually your work mattering in an engineering organization has a lot to do with what the other engineers think of it. And so is there a way for you to demonstrate that, for you to share that on a kind of regular basis and so forth? And then, you know, to get to the best new product ideas or new architecture ideas, it's really hard to do that remotely. So do you have a way to get them together for that and so forth? I think that's really different than, say, a sales organization um, where, look, they've always been hybrid, um, if they're, particularly if it's a direct sales force and not a kind of whatever phone sales force. And, you know, and you kind of, and they're kind of tried and true ways of when you put them together on forecast calls work, but like sales kickoff has to be a person, you know, where you're getting trained and that kind of thing and so forth. So, so I think decomposition is important. And then, you, you know, you, you've got to, uh, you know, just engineer in some things, uh, you know, cultural things on, and how you behave, how the managers behave, like, you know, what's over the line, you know, if somebody does something, do you like, how, how likely are you to pick up the phone and call them and talk to them about it, all these kinds of things. So it's a lot of, you know, it takes some real thought to deal with the fact that you're not like all together. Um, but I would say, you know, I, I feel like we're functioning um, kind of culturally as well as we ever have in the case. You know, like we have the investment teams have to be together in person certain days. We have a lot of offsites. Um, you know, we get everybody in the firm together once a year, like, you know, with the families and all that kind of thing. So, like, there's a lot of the rhythm to it is important. I mean, if you go back to everybody in the office, how much of that time was spent on email or on phone calls or doing isolated work? And, you know, the office is actually less productive for that, I think, for many people. Uh, although, depending on your age, right? Like, the older you are, the less productive that is. The younger you are, the kind of being in the office actually helps a lot. Yeah. 
What do you think is the most, like, what's the single, if I'm a CEO and I'm in the state that I describe, like, what's the single biggest, you know, what's the single biggest, most useful thing that I could do to, to sort of advance on this and make sure that I still have cultural coherence, you know, in two years out? Well, I mean, I, I think you got to start with like, okay, what do you, like, what are your cultural goals? Like, what are the behaviors, like, what do you want? You know, do you like, if you want like lots of new ideas and innovation and this kind of thing, um, do you want? Well, let me. Let me, let me, let me point it. Yeah. So, um, I want people to care about the company. Um, I want people to feel bonded to the company so that it's just not another, you know, they're just not, it's just not another interchangeable thing where they can log off zoom on Friday and log in another zoom on Monday and they just don't care that they left and that I'm just totally fungible as an employer. Yeah. So I think then like the things that kind of connect you to the people tend to be things like, okay, one-on-one meetings. Um, and, and those like even a one-on-one meeting on the phone is much more intimate than a uh, group Zoom. Uh, like a group Zoom is the most impersonal thing. Um, I would say high frequency of offsites um, where you get people together in person. Um, you know, hopefully like at least one day a week in the office for kind of that kind of thing is very, very helpful. And just like real like acknowledgement of i mean think of a, a very underrated thing whether you're in person or remote is acknowledgement of the work like so much of it is you know from an employee perspective is do i matter does the work i do matter do you care about it um and you know we just went through a performance review cycle here at the firm and like one of the biggest things you know that i've come to realize over the years in performance reviews is just like, you know, it's an expression. I know what's going on. I appreciate it. Um, where I, you know, here's things I'd love to work on together. Here's how we can develop you like this kind of thing. Just to, if you never have that conversation, then like, why would anybody feel good about the work they're doing? And, uh, and yeah, so that kind of thing ends up being, I think Jeff Bezos used to have a thing where he'd have a day a week where he would like focus on just, saying thank you to people, um, which is a strong, you know, Amazon, by the way, like I think under him had probably one of the highest levels of cohesive culture at scale. You know, uh, it's funny, there was a big takedown of the Amazon culture in the New York Times at one point, but, but I think, and you know, right or wrong, the things that they said in there, like overall, like in tech world, you know, of course, people at Amazon were very cohesive culturally and they had great retention with not the best pay, I would say other companies. So for sure. If I recall correctly, that takedown was because apparently it was a demanding workplace with high performance expectations. And so therefore. Well, yeah. And though, although like there was a real bit of truth to it in the sense that, so what they did is because they were a tech company and a retail company, they hired a lot of people from Nordstrom's, from Macy's, from these kinds of places. And they, drop them into a tech culture and people are like, you guys are fucking crazy. Like I got, I, you know, I work from nine to five. <laughs> what are you doing to me? You know, and they were crying and they were upset. And so yeah. And Amazon, by the way, reacted to that and created a uh, kind of subculture for their retail, for their true retail people who are really retail, not like Amazon retail. Uh, and you know, I'm a believer in subcultures. So I think that made sense. But yeah, yeah, it was very weird for us in Silicon Valley to read Amazon's got a bad culture. It's like, it's Amazon. Like, what are you talking about? The best culture. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, look, I think we're at, a, we're at an hour 20. I think that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, way, place to end. We got through right. five of our 25 questions. <laughs> uh, we did another uh, outstanding job on time, time management. So uh, we will leave it there for now. Benjamin, thank you. All right. And uh, we will... See you all soon. Awesome. Thank you for listening.